Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Global Vice President, Device as a Service, HP Inc., Mr. Jonathan Nichols. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here today with you. Um, thank you very much for your attention this afternoon. I think I am the last person between you and the break. Um, so again, um, we'll go through this and hopefully we'll have a little bit of fun as we, as we talk about this. It all starts with insights. And um, when we're talking about HP, we love to lead with market insights, with customer insights, and those insights that are coming from our sales organization. HP is now in year three of our reinvention. However, with that comes 50 plus years of optimizing a business with a hardware supply chain. The scale of HP operating in 170 countries in a multi-region, multi-channel platform has really allowed us to excel within our business of hardware. We know though, however, in order to stay current, in the new defining consumption models that you have to reinvest, reinvent your services business. And so as we look to create the new economic engines that we're striving to drive for to bring value to our customers and to our partners, we know that that consumption model has changed. We know it from our own personal lives in terms of the way that we consume technology today that is absolutely transforming itself from our consumer buying habits into the commercial buying habits that your customers are looking for. We know that we have to continue our goal of reinvention here at HP. So as we continue to move forward, we started thinking about what are really these tenants of change? What's really driving the transformation that we're really hearing from the market, from our customers and our partners? Well, epic sales events is how we used to go to market. In a transactional manner, you had to go out and create that offer. You had to understand what that customer was looking for. And as JB and Andreas talked about in their conversation with you this afternoon, it takes a long time. By the time that you actually get that solution created, the customer's requirements have most likely changed. We need to innovate and provide a more data-driven, analytic approach and drive a new PIMO type of a model so that we can bring solutions to bear in a quicker, more tentative way, not tentative way, in a more tenuous way so that our customers can start to get the value from our offerings better, faster, quicker. Another tenet of change is all about accountability. In the transactional business model, the accountability has been unfairly borne by the customer. They are the ones that are taking the risk. They are the ones that have to ensure that the outcomes that we promise them up front ultimately come to fruition. By shifting to the data-driven as a service model, we allow for a more shared accountability. This unlocks an increased acceleration of behaviors. We're able to implement that new killer capability. We're able to drive the value that the business buyers are needing, but we're also able to make sure that the IT organization can become heroes again. This allows for a bilateral beneficial engagement, accountability that is shared. Finally, one of the tenets of the transformation that we have been seeing is outcomes. In the transactional model, if you actually provided the customer with an outcome up front, it was stale, it was for a period of time. If you had an MBR or a QBR and were able to actually provide back to them the promise that your value was making, the promise that your offer was making, it was dated, it was old, it was always looking in the rearview mirror not in the here and now, not able to have a growth mindset in terms of how do we change that transformation, how do we change that solution into the here and to the now. In an as-a-service model, your outcomes become near real time. You're able to understand what is happening because you have implemented all of the different types of tools, people, and processes that are more applicable towards the solution orientation. So, the outcome-based economic model is something that um, we needed to take a look at. Uh, in the case of DAS, we identified a number of opportunities to move the ball forward in the hardware space. We could start including accessories, displays, 
third party types of equipment. We could come up with new types of end user compute. We could start pulling in different types of print, et cetera. However, um, with that, we know that you need to add in additional types of adjacencies, right? And so these are some of the, sim these are some of the simple things that you're able to do. Add in your lifecycle services, start aggregating together hardware, services, start to provide telemetry. But again, the telemetry without the so what really isn't meeting the customer's needs. So therefore, you have to start thinking about, hmm, how am I really going to get this value proposition across? Security is a newer area, at least for HP, in terms of that was really manifesting from our product up into our services organization. And we started to talk a little bit more and more about security. Well, ultimately, we have to shift that conversation. Hardware no longer leads, hardware enables. We talk about employee engagement first. How is that employee more engaged because of the solution that we are providing to them? How does a best in class device, ensuring that it's always working, that you're not getting the blue screens of death, that you're not worried about whether or not you're clicking on some phishing scam or gonna release something that's gonna cause your device to crash, really enables you to feel more productive, leading to more productivity. All making sure that you have the ability to have an enhanced security environment. The ultimate goal was to drive towards these business outcomes. We had to help our customers realize them. Only when we did that would we truly unlock the value of the as a service model. Our customers are seeking these outcomes, and that's what we set to deliver in our device as a service solution set. Well, now that we have identified this outcome-based economic engine, we also had to start to take a look at what was happening to our revenue. What were the revenue models that we already had in place today, and what was the evolution of that revenue model going to look like into the future? So many of you are familiar that when you have in the past, when you bought outright, usually we're selling a large install hardware base, shipping many units of whatever that you might have been selling. You put onto that what I usually like to call the hardware or the services software support tax. This was the area that your customers always kept to coming back to you at when it came time for renewal to lower because essentially as they continued to adopt your hardware solutions, they lacked investment dollars to be able to invest because they kept paying for just maintaining what they currently had. And maybe had the opportunity to do some design and some deployment, some professional services. But you sold this all transactionally in a CapEx type of a model. The evolution that we're kind of going through right now is really what I like to call upfront payment for a promise. The customer is still paying us for a promise that is yet to fulfill itself, for an outcome that they believe is going to happen based on our great salesmanship, based on our great offers, based upon our great delivery schemes, right? What are we really doing today in the industry is we're combining these disparate elements. Maybe there is some sort of financial treatment that goes across this, but you're still taking hardware, you're still taking services, you're still taking potentially analytics and new level 3D and level, four, level 3 types of capabilities, and you're putting them into an annuitized payment scheme. Maybe you're doing that through leasing, maybe you're doing that through a, soft, through a services contract model, but essentially what you're really doing is you're helping customers really come up with, you know, a cash flow benefit, a predictability of the services and the hardware that you're combining, and you're also, as a, as a provider, deferring that revenue, which is a new model for many of us in the room. You have to be able to understand that when you go to this model, no longer are you gonna get that one-time upfront revenue attainment, revenue recognition, I should say. You might get cash in hand, but not revenue recognition. And so therefore, your business needs to understand that you are gonna be moving into a deferred revenue model. So I would say today, the majority of the as-a-service models from a hardware plus services plus software perspective are probably playing in this range. But where we really wanna to get to and what our end state is and what we're designing for is really the ability of what I like to call promise fulfilled, now pay up. Essentially, 
the outcome-based model allows you to move away from a bomb-up type of a costing perspective, a bomb-up type of profitability perspective, bomb being bill of materials of that hardware, of those services offers, of that software offer, and essentially, you're just selling them outcomes. You're selling your customers the promise, and only if you deliver on that promise will you be paid. The onus moves 100% to the provider at this point in time. Now, many of you might think that um, these models aren't really apparent. Well, they are. We're used to them. I mean, what is old is new again. Telephony has been this way back when AT&T and Ma Bell were first putting together. You rented your phone, you had your circuit, the call was completed, and you paid. Right? This is where we're looking to go to in the new environment with new distributed models. Hardware refresh, flex capabilities, cascading, asset pools, multi-device, faster delivery promises are all going to be part of the onus of the provider. Services, the data, the persona migration, the ongoing management, proactive services, again, all the onus of the provider. The analytics, process optimization, outcome validation, security assessment, monitoring, all the, prom all the onus of the provider. Finally, those security assessments, the reporting, the optimization, and the assurance that this solution is going to work. Because essentially, when you buy an as-a-service offering, your expectation is that it just works that your promise is fulfilled. And that is where we are driving this device as a service category. So that's what we learned a lot about in terms of the market research, our customer insights, our partner insights, what our sales organizations were telling us. We needed to lay the foundation. I'll be very honest with you. As we started building the category, we weren't to market and wanted to be all things to all people. We went to market a la carte. No consistency in offering, no global consistency, no consistency in structure. That obviously failed. In an as-a-service model, you have to ensure that there is global consistency in the offer that you are making to your customer. Because unless you control that offering, there is no way that you're going to be able to offer the outcomes that our customers so dearly want and need. So what do we do? We went back to the drawing board. We commissioned a worldwide research event spanning over 25,000 unique insights across 2,000 unique customers, all the way from the SMB up into the enterprise accounts. Our customers absolutely surprised us in terms of what they felt was going to be the value in the offer. Because remember, if you don't start with insights, you're going to create something that is most likely going to fail. So, we distilled the solution. We knew that our customers were asking us for greater ease of consumption. We knew that we needed to ensure that the linchpin of our offering was that we would monetize on analytics and business insights as the engine of the future. Data is the new currency. The way you deliver is really behind the scenes, and the customers will pay for information that allows them to be smarter in the business decisions that they're making. Whether that is enhanced procurement, the ability to build out rooms because you have data coming in from how those rooms are being used by the end compute devices that are in those rooms. The ability to ensure global consistency. The reason global consistency is so fundamental to the as a service model is that customers are very quickly understanding that they are not unique in their needs to drive out cost. And they are not unique in their needs to have everything customized any longer. Gone are the days of customization. Here are the days of repeatability and tailorization. The ability to pull a lever to ensure that you're getting the outcome that you want. Customization means I built it exclusively for you and it is non-repetitive. If you ask any customer if they truly want something that is customized, they will tell you no if you put it in those terms. Driving the layer engagement. Again, 
You heard me say that if your outcome is gonna be to give outcomes and price on promise fulfilled pay up, you need to help them connect the dots. You need to ensure that you are training your sales organizations, both your direct as well as your partners, on value. Value leads, price is secondary. You have to invest in tools and capabilities and trainings that allow you to truly demonstrate this value that you are creating because it is not necessarily apparent. Today, when you go to market in a transactional environment, procurement organizations, sellers, buyers, all compare widget X to widget Z, service one to service two. They understand how to do that. They don't understand the value that you might be creating that is not apparent to them. This allows you to continue to earn your keep because you're going to continue to have to do it. So those elements of what we like to call value drivers are something that become living and you consistently have to deliver upon those promises. So how are we executing towards this ultimate goal? Well, first and foremost, we still have a hardware component. We are a hardware company. We will continue to be a hardware company, but we are creating new revenue engines through our as-a-service models. Not only did we utilize HP hardware, but we also bring in, brought in third-party hardware and opened it up to a multi-OS environment. As an OEM and one of the leading end-user compute manufacturers in the world, it seems somewhat contradictory to some of our um, team members that we would actually take on support of a multi-vendor environment. There is not one company in the world that is homogeneous in terms of the types of devices and operating systems that they have today. Every single customer has at least two. Probably all of you have five. Mobility, different types of PC, OS, and then Windows versions. The platform. JB talked a little bit earlier in his keynote about software eating services. The platform is something that is, needs to be extensible. It has to be ecosystem driven, and it has to ensure that the user experience is transparent and that you are manifesting all of that data and all that intelligence that you're able to collect, not just on their usage, but also on the greater ecosystem, ensuring security and not providing um, insight into others' data that is, um, that is um, recognizable, but ensuring that that platform is there to drive the automation of your services. We have built this platform. Uh, we will continue to build across this platform. This platform essentially allows us to share those insights directly with our customers, directly with our partners in a very transparent and open manner. And finally, the services expansion and the capability sets to deliver on that as a service promise was something that we had to continue to build upon. We have very, very good level one and level two types of services within HP Inc. What we didn't necessarily have were all of the additional services that were gonna be needed in order to deliver against this as a service promise. We needed to increase and invest in our professional services capabilities around security, around OS transformation. We had to ensure that our managed services capabilities became more predictive and proactive, that there were platforms that we were leveraging in order to do those. And then ultimately our optimization services really around driving that insight off of the analytics that we were collecting is really paramount to the success of executing towards our goal. So, we took the customer insights, we took the market insights, we understood the economic engine that we were trying to create, we understood the revenue models in terms of what was gonna happen. We understood where we failed, we understand where we were course correcting, we started building plans. However, now we need to ensure that the success of what we have built is taking place. You only have one time to make a first impression as the saying goes. In an as a service model, if you do not turn around quickly, and on board quickly and ensure that you're on time with your quality, you will not get any further. Your adoption will stop. You will not have the opportunity to ensure that you're able to expand upon that offer and very rarely will you ever even get to a renewal, point of view, uh, a renewal opportunity. 
initial delivery is the fundamental success criteria when you're moving into an as-a-service model when you were transactional before. The ability to have transformation management capabilities, program management capabilities, is very significant in terms of the ability for us to succeed. Once they're onboarded, once you've landed, we absolutely adhere to the layer methodology. We have been building out our run rate management. We have created customer success organizations. We have invested in tools. We call it the value management office and one of my partners is here um, at the event um, as well that can talk more about this as well. But we invested in value management office which essentially creates those value drivers that allow our customers to have a handshake agreement with us in terms of the value that we're creating together that then we can take ownership for and deliver against that promise. The customer success management organization is unique within an HP environment. Um, I know that a lot of companies are still looking through how they're going to implement that. Um, we still um, are believing that it's something that um, is going to bridge both our sales as well as our services organizations, uh, somewhat of a hybrid model. But it's something that is investing in and is paramount again to our success. Keeping and growing. So um, our platform that I talked about has sold very, very well. The implementation of that platform in terms of customers taking their devices on and being able to get the great information that we're able to provide them has actually been slower than what we would like. We have an opportunity to accelerate the adoption of analytics. We have millions of devices sending back telemetry to us that allows for a very rich environment and database that we can actually provide information to our customer set. This allows us to come up with new business insight programs, new offerings in terms of consulting and the optimized portfolio that allows for the expansion into our level three types of services offerings. Um, HP is not new to the as-a-service model. We have a rich heritage with our managed print services business that really allows us to have this type of an intimate engagement with our customers in terms of showing the different types of device telemetry, the, the ability to understand proactive um, insights and, and um, proactive uh, fixes to the environment. Um, so this is something that is near and dear to our culture, but we're still growing that from a device as a service perspective. We're moving from net promoter score into what we like to call total customer health scoring. Net promoter score is good, but the ability to truly understand how your health is with that customer in terms of, will they recommend you, of course, but how are they adopting? What does the SLA look like? What's our expansion looking like? Um, it's important to ensure that these are the types of methodologies that we're putting in place in order to score ourselves. more importantly, to ensure that our customers are happy. HP um, starts with our customers, the needs of our customers, their outcomes. We listen first and we build second. We have a partner base that is world class. We have 80% of the HP revenue stream goes through our partner community. It is near and dear to us. There is no way to be successful in incubating this route to market than through our partner relationships. However, as usual, partners do believe that any effort that an OEM is doing to expand services is often taken as competitive. So we had to show value add and create a transparent environment for our partners to believe that they were gonna be able to participate in this as a service resolution. As I told you earlier when we were building out the plans, we built them specifically with our partners in mind. Our partners, just like us, need to have healthy reoccurring revenue streams. Only then will the category grow. We need the category to grow. We need everybody to be healthy from the very good revenue streams that allow an as a service model to move forward. HP, when we look at our heritage, is 80 years young. We thrive on reinvention. 
we are taking advantage of this market revolution and we are looking for more. Our customers are looking for more. Your customers are looking for more. They want more simplicity in your offerings. They want more trust in your dealings. They want more meaningful outcomes for all of us. So I really want to thank you for the opportunity to share with you a little bit about what we're doing at HP in the device as a service business. And I wish you a great conference and look forward to any conversations that might come next. Thank you, have a good evening. <laughs>